Let's pray. God of word and wisdom, your spirit inspired the authors of scripture with faithfulness in their day. Send us your Holy Spirit as we listen to you now. Give us fresh understanding and a vision of how to live out your wisdom in the example of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're now in week four of working straight through Jonah. So the last chapter. And it's interesting how some stories remain timely over and over again. As we get to the end of Jonah, we are entering, as I said earlier, a week where we mark the one-year anniversary of a war in Ukraine. It's also eight years ago this week that ISIS militants beheaded 21 men on a Libyan beach. I don't know if you know this, they were young Coptic Christian migrant workers from Egypt. One of them was from Ghana. It's the sort of tragedy that keeps coming. They're very familiar. We're witnessing violence repeatedly. We see this and we dehumanize each other. We create the other with the capital O. And some of us like to think that this is for those people over there. But if you read the news, you're perfectly aware that violence takes place here as well. It's taking place on our continent, it's taking place on our streets, and it's certainly taking place in homes. Lately on Facebook, I've been sharing these little videos by this group called He Gets Us. You might have seen these. Their point is to offer high-quality advertising linking Jesus to our daily lives, pointing the ways that he lives into the aspirations we share. They're often pretty powerful. They are somewhat countercultural in that they're full of still photos, often black and white, and backed by a sort of strong and moody music. They have what can only be described as a remarkable budget. Their goal is to raise one billion with a B, and they're throwing their weight around. In football, in the NFL, the American one, you know, you can't advertise for religious purposes on national broadcasts. It's against the rules. So this group said, we don't care. We, they figured an end around. All local broadcasts are up to the local broadcasters. So if you're in Arizona, say, where the Super Bowl is about to happen, you can put advertisements in the Arizona market, but not in the national market. So they picked five of the biggest markets in the NFL, and they spent the last two years putting ads into these games. Then they went to the NFL and they said, we want to have two spots in the Super Bowl. And the NFL said, absolutely not. No religious advertising on our national broadcasts. Five owners stood up at the meeting and said, you won't believe how much mail we get about these ads. We got to let them do it. So they looked at them. And they said, well, they're not denominational. They're not for a specific church. They're not whatever. So we'll let it go. To be clear, Super Bowl ads are still not cheap. A 30-second spot runs you $7 million. He gets us last week, bought 90 seconds worth of time. We're going to look at both of them because, again, somehow things just work out well every now and then for me. The first video is 30 seconds. It took place in the first half of the Super Bowl, and it makes you smile. It's about racial integration, getting along, and being childlike. I particularly like it because it reminds me a few years ago, we had an Indigenous kid living with us, and uh, people pointed out that he was brown, you know, and Oliver wasn't, and that was weird for us. And one day, the kids were running up and down at a park, and Oliver stops, and he says, you know, some people say you're brown, but when we run, we both get all shiny. <laughs> and so ads like this, I find particularly nice. So we'll run the first one. What a wonderful world this would be. There'd be no trouble and no... 
so they they spent seven million dollars to put that out in the world. Well, that's just the time, right? The ad got people very smug, right? Don't we love this one? Aren't we good people? We Christians, we're so lovely, we're childlike. The second ad, again, Christians are doing this. It's meant to be a gut punch, mostly to the church itself, and I think that's why the people like it. It's trying to be a prophetic voice. Speaking to us are about our reality. We want to be people who get along and are childlike and help each other out. We want to be people that run together and play together. And yet we're not those people. So now we'll run the second ad. This one, 60 seconds, and took place in the second half. Maybe I'm blind Thinking I can see through this And see what's behind Got no way to prove it So maybe I'm lying Take a look in the mirror What do you see? Do you see it clearer? Or are you deceived? In what you believe Cause I'm only human Fourteen million, and people are talking. We might be careful when we read the last chapter of Jonah about how haughty we want to be, how much better than Jonah we like to think we are, because if we are like the rest of the culture we're in, we are more like Jonah than we want to admit. And if we are part of Christianity in North America, we are more like the second ad than the first. Jonah does not come off well in a book that bears his name. He hasn't looked good so far, you know, but this is a whole new low. You got to understand the context though, right? So instead of rejoicing that 120,000 people are saved from disaster, he sulks and would pout and would like to die. Nineveh is more than just a violent town where things have gone from bad to worse. It's one of the chief rivals and threats to Israel. It's a looming presence. It is ever threatening. In Canada, we literally have nothing like this. Many scholars argue that Jonah was probably right. Within about 40 years, the northern kingdom of Israel gets ransacked. There's rape, there's fire, there's famine, and lots of grisly death at the hands of the Ninevites. So when Jonah sits on the outside of town and says, these are the last people I want to see you be compassionate and faithful to, he has very good reason for that. And he will be proven right. He would like to see them brought to their knees. I would dare suggest there are many groups of people that we feel that way about, whether we want to admit it or not. The analogy is the second video, right? Look at the anger, the hate in some of those people's faces. They are normal people. They are average people. They take their kids to swim lessons. They buy their grandkids ice cream. And then they wind up in an ad like that. Regular people feel this way. Many feel it about Russia now, right? If you're in Ukraine, I don't imagine it's easy to pray for peace for Russia, pray for mercy. That's how people looked at the Assyrian Empire that Jonah has gone to talk to. Jonah, if you want to understand his reaction, you have to put himself in his shoe, yourself in his shoes. Who are you incapable of forgiving? Who has wronged you 
or someone you love so grievously that you cannot conceive of them flourishing. You haven't thought of someone or some group. I'll throw some out there for you. Just to demonstrate, you're probably on this page. How do you feel about dog abusers? Child abusers? Wife abusers? ISIS, Putin, whoever makes indigenous girls disappear. Maybe it's closer to home. Someone's cheated on you or was unfaithful in their marriage to your children. Maybe someone told you your illness won't get healed because you don't know how to pray properly. Maybe you don't have enough kids because you don't pray properly. Maybe someone says that your spouse or your parent or your grandparents' mind is attacked by dementia or Alzheimer's because they were never that good a person anyway, and the world's better without them. People share these stories with me regularly. This is what I hear. The point is, there's people in everybody's life that have hurt us so much that we don't want to see them do well. To lighten the mood slightly, you can see you're feeling pretty heavy now. When we went over this at Bible study, somebody said they went to work and this one person was always late. And they, they were really annoyed that this person's always late, right? And so then we conceived of a, of a world, a universe where that person won $5 million and they didn't have to go to work anymore. And rather than be happy for them, you would be bitter, wouldn't you? You would be ticked off. Pettiness, the inability to rejoice at the salvation of others is hardly Jonah's sole prerogative. Jonah goes and he sits down outside of town and he waits to see what's going to happen next. I love this. You know what he's doing when he's sitting on that hill? I think he's waiting for them to mess up. He's like, oh yeah, they repented. Sure. Sure, I'm going to go sit and wait. They'll show you, God. They're going to show you how dumb they are, how violent they are, how terrible, how ungrateful, how un undeserving. They duped you, God. I'm going to sit here and you're going to see it. God sends him a vine. Be like, oh yeah, here, get comfy. <laughs> Jonah sits outside of town and then a worm destroys the vine. It's just, I don't know who comes up with this. Jonah is concerned about the plant, apparently. That's where the story goes. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume he has turned into a great environmentalist overnight. He can't handle the thought of one less plant in the world. The plant grows overnight, and Jonah feels a sense of responsibility for it. And he's real sad when that worm gets it. And God says, you pity the plant. And I'm not supposed to pity the 120,000 people. Really? In that moment, God accepts Jonah for who he is, a selfish little man sitting outside of a town he hopes will be destroyed. Petty that his one blessing, the vine, has been taken away from him. And I have been with Jonah in this moment, and I bet you have. I came up with two. You have a bad day. All day, you look forward to a treat. I don't know, ice cream or something. You go out, you buy the ice cream, you take two steps and the ice cream falls in the sand and you just want to rip somebody. Or perhaps more reasonably for grown-ups, all day long, you picture opening that special bottle of wine you've been waiting for. You go outside, you sit down with whoever, you open the bottle and then promptly a wasp comes and flans in your bottle and you just want to cry <laughs> you know you're an adult pouting you know it's silly you know it's ridiculous and yet you sit there and pout i've been there i know you have in that moment god says you value these trivial things where do you see how much i can value my creation how can you question my caring of something of such greater value, something I've worked for, put time into, cared for. Can't you see in those moments, whatever that sense of disappointment and love is, that's why I'm relating to all of creation, and you don't have to like them. 
Like the great city of Nineveh, it doesn't pop up overnight. It's 120,000 people in ancient days. This was a real accomplishment. Like there's not a lot of cities like this. It's full of people that God says he has created in his own image for his own glory, and it, they are to be important because of that. They are way more important than our ice cream, our wine, or Jonah's little plant. So when God says they're going in the wrong direction, he has sympathy for them. He wants to correct the situation. He doesn't have to enjoy that. He doesn't have to enjoy punishing them in order to correct them. And part of the story is in the pain of the people, God himself is pained, and he wants to avoid punishing them, if at all possible. That's why Jonah's mad. Jonah wants vengeance. He wants them to get what they deserve. But the Bible repeatedly teaches us violence begets more violence, and while defense is sometimes needed, it's not needed nearly as often as we think it is. For instance, you might remember mass shootings where families of victims promise to pray for the killers. Have you seen these? There's a whole lot of stories of this, where they go out and they have vigils, and they pray for the killers. They pray for mercy because the killers don't deserve mercy, but they need it, and they need forgiveness. And the alternative would be to seek vengeance and make their families feel as bad as they do, but that won't get us anywhere. And their forgiveness is more than just posturing in empty words. They're not just looking to have the media on their doorstep. It's an important step forward. When it comes to Nineveh, they are doing violence against God. They're doing violence against God's people. They're doing violence against creation itself. And something needs to be done about it. Behaving badly on an ongoing basis is not supposed to go unnoticed. Now, some of us, this is going to be very unpopular. I know you're going to email me about this. Some of you have either been spanked or have spanked your children. It's true. Not, I'm not talking abusive beatings. I'm not talking where you have fun and get your jollies out of beating somebody or like letting your inner rage out, but the sort of corrective swats that parents resort to from time to time. Disciplinarians don't generally enjoy this. They aren't easy. I know almost all of my friends said I will never do it, and almost all of them did it. They take no pleasure in it. But the outcome is what they think is so important. I've had mothers, they are shaken. They are crying. They are unhappy with themselves because they have gone down this road. I think most parents would agree you would like to avoid this, if at all possible. What God is telling Jonah is in correcting his creation, he feels something similar to that. He wants to transform the people. He wants them to repent. He wants them to change, do something different. And the very last way he wants to do it is to do something violent. And Jonah's more worried about the plant. God sees the people of Nineveh. He sees Putin and the Russians. He sees ISIS. He sees mask wearers and anti-vaxxers. He sees the convoyers and those who want to live in peace. He sees the soldiers who crucify Jesus, and he sees Jesus, and he sees people. He loves us enough to want us to flourish and to be on the right path and withhold punishment if at all possible. He would have us see each other that way. In Luke 23, we just read, as they're killing him, he's on the cross, he's trying to catch his breath. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He's not paranoid. He's not paranoid that somebody's out to get him. He isn't justifiably worried that a group might destroy him and his people. He isn't upset about being cut off in traffic. He's actively dying on a cross with metal struck through his body. And at that moment, he asks for forgiveness. Forgive them, not because they deserve it, but because they don't understand. Jonah told the Ninevites they needed to repent, they needed to change their ways, and then they could be saved. The He Gets Us ad is telling us something similar. 
We need to turn from what we're doing. We are swirling into something dangerous and ugly and angry. God knows we could be more like the kids getting along. God gets us. He knew his father would listen to him when he asked for forgiveness. He knew that his death was going to pave the way forward for us. That's why he submitted to it. That's what he came to do. To suffer what we could never tolerate. To open up possibilities of forgiveness beyond anything we could imagine. And it's hard. Not enough people, I think, get this. Jonah is about the idea that God saves and he does so in a way that you should be scandalized and angry about it. He's generous in forgiveness. All proper company should be really mad at this. Grace is to bless and offend you at the same time. And if it's not, you're not understanding it. Grace means that what you have done is just as bad. You might minimize it. You will ignore it. You can be impatient and then get mad at somebody else's impatient. You can speed on the highway and then get mad when somebody else speeds. You can run a light and then get mad when somebody else runs the light. You can bring your library book back late, but the other person can't. Whatever it is, the double standard is true in us. Grace means that matters. You can explain it away, but it's still there. It also means that God saves it. Saves the men in the sea, he saves Jonah, he saves the Ninevites, he saves you. We like that part. But he also saves the dog abuser. He also saves the people that yell at you. He saves the people you yell at. He saves the black, the white, and all the other beautiful colors of the world. He saves the rich, and he saves the poor. He saves the urine-soaked, and he saves the overly perfumed person that makes your head hurt. And he saves everybody in between. He saves the arrogant world junior hockey players who think they can do whatever they want. He saves the pimps and the pimped out. He saves the straight, the LGBTQI+. He saves the people who hurt you. Hurt your families. Saves all of them. That's the story. Sees us as broken, not knowing what we're doing as we hurt each other. And then it gets worse. Luke 6, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can you imagine You don't want to let this slide. You don't want to let it go. This is where the church fails. This is why churches close. We ignore this stuff. We don't get it. You have to get it. I'm going to pray in a minute. I, I'm going to pray that we would be agents that break cycles of violence, break cycles of dehumanization, break the cycle that makes others an O with a capital O. Pray that we would see each other as shiny when we sweat alongside of each other. And pray that we would see people the way God does, made in his image, whether we like them or not, whether we like what they're doing or not. Let's pray about it. Father, we thank you for all that you do. Lord, we pray for patience to overcome our own pettinesses. Lord, we pray that we would not be pouting, but that we would be grateful and thankful. Lord, we pray that we would overcome the pride, the ego, all that comes between us and those you love. Lord, it is not easy. Lord, sometimes people find it so hard to do this. We have to pray for them. So I, I want to pray, Lord, for the people in Ukraine. I can't imagine how they pray for the Russians right now. And yet Jonah has to go pray for the Ninevites. God, tear down the barriers, the borders, the things that are coming between us. Help us to see the humanity in one another and help us to see the godliness in one another.
Help us to see our own need for forgiveness and help us to accept the forgiveness and then to share it with others. Lord, none of this is possible. I can't do it. None of us in this room can do it. Through your spirit, we can do it. And so, Lord, would your spirit come upon us and upon all your churches that we would be more like the childlike version of the world than the adult. We pray it all in Jesus' most powerful name. Amen.